All right, guys, let's uh, finish up our chemotherapy drugs here. So hormone antagonist, and um, it's kind of interesting that we have used hormone and uh, hormone antagonists in cancer treatment, but some cancers are hormone sensitive and hormone receptor sensitive. And so it's been kind of another novel way that we can um, treat cancer. So the most common one is tamoxifen. It's been around for a really long time. Um, it originally came from the Amazon rainforest. Um, and so kind of interesting what comes out of those discoveries. And now it's made, you know, it's made in a lab and um, we don't have to kill trees anymore for that. But uh, so it blocks estrogen, re estrogen receptors in some tissues and slows tumor growth, but this only works for estrogen receptor positive um, cancer. So it doesn't work um, on every single um, cancer, breast cancer. Um, it's used for metastatic breast cancer, and it's also used prophylactically for those who are genetically um, at high risk for breast cancer, like BRCA1 and 2. The problem with taking it prophylactically is it's got a lot of side effects. And so, um, you know, like nausea, vomiting, hot flashes, hypercalcemia, vaginal dryness. So it's not really um, something that people love to take. So taking it prophylactically is a little bit challenging. Um, it's associated with an increased incidence of uterine or endometrial cancers and serious and life-threatening events, including stroke and pulmonary emboli have occurred. And there is a tie between estrogen and clot development, um, which is why, if you think about it, a lot of the birth control pills have as a risk um, clotting. And so you have to be careful. In fact, anyone who smokes cigarettes should not be taking oral birth control pills. Um, because the combination of the two of those, smoking and BCPs, um, can lead to much higher risk of having clot. Cytoprotectant drugs. Now, I've, I've made this list smaller just to fill Grastim, Nupigen, and Epo, Epinalpha, or Epigen. So, Nupigen is um, a leukopoietic growth factor. It stimulates production of the neutrophils and it shortens that nadir. Okay, and we've talked about that in class. Um, it increases neutrophil production and enhances the phagocytic and cytotoxic function of neutrophils. So it really just helps the neutrophils, helps it, um, stimulate their production and it also makes them work better. So it's used. Um, for um, trying to minimize chemotherapy-induced neutropenia, which then risks uh, lowers the risk of infection. Um, it should not be used in people with myeloid malignancies. And again, long explanation I could go into, but um, it's thought that it can actually stimulate the growth of myeloid malignancies. <clears throat> so that myeloid um, cell line so you'll notice that some people who get chemotherapy are not taking this medication, and that's probably why. Um, you don't want to give this within 24 hours of giving chemo. Again, it's kind of like, you know, let the chemo do its thing and begin to wear off before we start trying to beef up the neutrophils. And you want to monitor CBC prior to treatment and twice weekly during treatment with filgrastim. And you're probably... Um, going to see now if patients are outpatient then they might get counts a little less frequently twice weekly would probably be the minimum um, but if they're in hospital of course these are going to be done every single day and one of the problems is that it really can cause bone pain you know it's stimulating your bone marrow to make these neutrophils and um, this drug has actually been used for people who want to be bone marrow donors like through the National Registry, and sometimes the pain is really significant, it can make, make it so that they actually need narcotics um, to deal with it. And then, of course, it can cause leukocytosis, which is an overproduction of white cells, because that's what we're trying to do with it. Okay, antiemetics. Anti-barf drugs, okay? 
some chemotherapies are more, um, we call it barphogenic, more emetogenic, meaning that they are more prone to causing nausea and vomiting than others. And so based on the drugs that we are giving, we want to make sure that one of the things we're doing as nurses is advocating and making sure that our patients are getting um, pre-medicated for nausea and vomiting, um, chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting prior to receiving their chemotherapy. And nothing makes me more frustrated as a nurse than to see a patient on highly emetogenic regimen and then see that all the antiemetics are PRN or as needed. So it's like, come on, folks. Of course they're going to need them. So you would hate to think that a nurse would never, you know, would not give um, an antiemetic knowing that the chemotherapy causes a misses, but you just want to be really sure that you're advocating for your, your patient. And if you don't see any antiemetics ordered, then you want to go over and like thunk the provider upside the head because clearly they've forgotten. Um, mechanism of action for Reglin is... It blocks dopamine receptors and serotonin receptors in the chemoreceptor trigger zone. So it basically works in your brain, um, and works in your central nervous system, and it enhances gastric motility, meaning that your stomach is not just going to sit there with something in it. Your stomach's going to keep trying to move whatever's in there out of it, which is good because when food just sits in our stomach, that's when we can um, have nausea. So, um, so it can be good for that. The only problem is it does cause these extra pyramidal effects. Um, and so you want to be careful if somebody's been getting Reglan for a while, they're more at risk. And you're definitely at risk um, if you're using it in children under the age of 18. So be very careful about that. So if you have a patient that's been on it for a while, um, and it can work beautifully for nausea and vomiting, um, but you see that they're restless or have anxiety, don't forget that Reglan has these CNS effects because that's where it's doing its work. Um, it also has a black box warning. It can cause tardive dyskinesia, which is related to, um, you know, your movement. So it's these un, um, kind of uncoordinated methodical movements um, you'll see it in people who've been treated with certain drugs for psychosis. So tardive dyskinesia is a, um, is a possible side effect. You can look it up on Google and see uh, videos of what it looks like. There's actually a new drug out now to treat tardive dyskinesia because um, once you see it, um, sometimes it doesn't go away. So it's a little scary. Um, and then what else? Um, I think that's really it. Just monitor for extra pyramidal symptoms and avoid activities requiring mental alertness. So you want to take it like 30 minutes before a meal again. So it's like fully activated when the, the patient goes to eat. Zofran. This is a serotonin receptor antagonist. And remember, we talked about the fact that you have these serotonin receptors in your gut. We don't think about that. We often think about serotonin in the brain, but, um, the release of serotonin can actually stimulate that chemoreceptor trigger zone. So uh, blocking that um, is helpful. So it's used for the prevention of chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting. That's what CINV is, and radiation-induced emesis, um, and hyperemesis gravidarum. So you may even see it being used in pregnant patients who have really bad um, nausea during pregnancy. Uh, it's usually oral or parenteral, meaning it can be given IV. Um, actually, it's very interesting because you have these receptors in your stomach. Um, there's a thought that oral Zofran is actually really, really helpful, like more helpful than IV. But if you're nauseated and you can't get it down, then it doesn't really matter um, that, you know, it's oral because if you can't keep it down, then it's not doing you any good. So uh, side effects, it can cause headache, headache, sedation, diarrhea, constipation, transient elevations in liver enzymes. Um, honestly, I've given this stuff like candy for years and 
you know, I think it does cause some of these things, but really there are no major, major um, side effects from it. You can have some EKG changes, so you need to be careful. Make sure that you're giving um, the right dose, which is four to eight milligrams, and it depends on the size of the person. I've actually even given two milligrams before, so um, just be careful about not exceeding um, a, you know, the 16 milligram single dose amount. And then always give before chemotherapy, okay? Should really be given on a scheduled basis um, and give 30 minutes prior to chemotherapy. So Zofran can be given every eight hours. And basically, once your patient starts chemotherapy, they should get Zofran every eight hours until they're done with their chemo. Um, and we know how they're going to do um, nausea and vomiting wise. And then Nader, watch this. I made um, this little video about Nader. And um, so we've talked about it in class, but I would really encourage that you watch this again. And again, you're going to get my drawing skills. So for what that's worth. Um, but I do think knowing about the Nader and what it is and what it means and why it's important as nurses to recognize when a patient's at their nadir is critical to this discussion. And if you have any questions about that, let me know. And that is it. All right, guys, have a great week. Bye.